Hare Krishna. So we continue with chapter ten. So chapter seven, nine. They were very much about detachment. That Atreya was so detached that he just fixed his mind on the Supreme Lord and not, did not deal with the material world, world at all. How to come to this level of detachment is an issue that comes up next. So, chapter 10 starts in a practical sense, starting with Parnashram. Act according to your nature. The result come, and then be detached from the results that... Uh, so we hear from the Bhagavatam, Dharma Spanustita Pumsa Vibhakshana Katasya Nopadya Tiyatea Tim Shrama Ike Eva Ike Balam. The occupational activist man performs according to his position and only so much useless labor if they do not provoke attraction for the message of the personality of God. So the purpose should be to be attracted to the superior personality of God. And the Bhagavatam says that Tamasya ye apavarga sya nachtrita e kalpate nachtasya dramakanta se kamalabaya ismita. All occupational engagement are certainly meant for the ultimate, liber ultimate liberation. They should never be performed for material gain. Furthermore, according to sages, when we engage in ultimate occupation, should never be used material gain for the cultivation of. Sense gratification. So occupational duties are not for obtaining sense gratification. They are meant for getting the attachment from sense gratification. That's the purpose. And but this is a gradual path until one comes to the point of bhakti. That the same there is there in karma yoga. Then karma yoga, the soul, the soul does not identify with the body. So the purpose of Parnashram is liberation. That, uh, so now that uh, then yes, by be by being detached from the results of one work, one can then come to the next level of the yoga ladder and can go from karma to jnana. Then in chapter 11, we will hear how detached karma yoga leads to bhakti. The karma yoga's purpose is to lead to bhakti. Mm -hmm. So, yes. In chapter 12, then we'll speak about the topmost position of the residence of Vrindavan. In the Uddhav Gita, Lord Krishna gives more emphasis how everything leads to bhakti in these chapters. So we will start with uh, chapter 10, that uh, the first, the first uh, step to come to the detachment is to understand the nature of fruitive activity. And I will read for you the purpose, the chapter summary. That, um, so, the chapter summary. This is a summary, summary by Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati. In this chapter, Lord Krishna refutes the doctrines of, of philosophers like Jaimani and describes to Uddhav how the conditioned soul can develop pure transcendental knowledge. When we is fully surrendered unto the Supreme Lord should follow the Vaishnava Dharma, that is described in the Pancharatma and other revealed scriptures. 
according to its natural qualities and, and work, one should follow the rules of Varnashram without duplicity. So-called knowledge that is received through one's material sense, mind, and intelligence is as useless as, as the dreams experienced by a person attached to sense gratification. Therefore, one should give up work for sense gratification and accept work as a matter of duty. When one has come to understand something of the truth of the self, he should give up material work performed out of duty and simply dedicate himself completely to the service of a bona fide spiritual master who is the manifest rep representative of the personal of quoted. A disciple should have firm faith in the spiritual master and should be anxious to learn from the signs of the soul. And he should be free from envy and the tendency to indulge in nonsense talk. The spirit soul is separate from the gross and subtle bodies. As the, the embodied soul accepts different kinds of bodies according to his karma, only a bona fide spiritual master is able to impart the knowledge of self-realization by refuting the philosophers of Jaimini and others. Lord Sri Krishna explains that the embodied soul has come in contact with segmented material time, takes up himself a perpetual chain of, of, of births and deaths, and is therefore forced, forced to suffer the resultant happiness and distress. Thus, there is no possibility that one who is attached to the fruits of material work can achieve any substantial goal in life. The pleasures of heaven which are achieved by performing sacrificial rituals can be experienced for only a short time. After one's heavenly enjoyment is finished, one must return to this mortal sphere to partake of lamentation and suffering. On the path of materialism, there is certainly no interrupted happiness. So that's the summary that uh, now we will read text one. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Shri Bhagavan Vachamayo Dasa Bahaitaha Svadame Shamadasvaya Parnashrama Kulacharam Akamatma Samatya Sharat the Supreme Personality of God had said, Taking full shelter in me with the mind carefully fixed in the devotional service of the Lord as spoken by me, one should live without personal desire and practice the social and occupational system called Varnashram. That uh, one can, someone can read the purpose, which is on the screen. <laughs> In the previous chapters, Lord Krishna described through the story of an Avadhuta Brahmana the qualities and characters of a saintly person. Now, the Lord describes the practical means for achieving such a saintly position. In the Pancharatra and other scriptures, the personality of God gives instructions for executing devotional service. Similarly, in Bhagavad Gita, 4.13, the Lord says, Chatur, Chatur Varnyam Maya system, Guna Karma Vibhagasa. I have personally created the Varnashrama system. There are innumerable rules and regulations in the Varnashrama system. And the devotee should execute those which do not contradict the process of devotional service. The term Varna indicates different classes of human beings. Some in the mode of ignorance, some in the mode of passion, some in the mode of goodness. Devotional service to the Lord is executed on the liberated platform. And therefore, some injunctions for those persons in passion and ignorance may be contradictory to the regulative principles for those, in the, those on the platform, liberated platform. Therefore, under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master who is non-different from the Lord, one should execute the basic principles of Varnashrama in a way favorable for advancement in Krishna consciousness. Thank you. Thank you. I have the purport here of Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Manj. 
Shesi Sipun Lot said, said, Once you take shelter of me and walk under my direction while following the system of Parnashan, one gives up my shelter and engages in furtive activities due to material attachment, he will never attain his ultimate welfare. When one follows Parnashram and family tradition simply for amassing pious merit rather than for engaging in my service, one is certainly misdirected and will never attain eternal benefit. Despite executing one's duties and prescribed, prescribed by me in the Vedas and rejecting all prohibited activities, if one does not take shelter of me, then his endeavor is ultimately useless. On the other hand, if one engages in my devotion service without deviation, that uh, there is no necessity for performing the religious duties prescribed in the Vedas. When my unalloyed devotees fail to observe all the rules and regulations prescribed in the Vedas, they should never be considered as misguided. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, this is clear, the purpose of our nation for devotees, that um, devotees motive to uh, conduct our nation is engagement in the Lord's service, that uh, not for amassing pious credits or uh, not any other material benefit that um, if one does so one is misguided text two a purified soul should she see that because the conditioned souls were dedicated to sense gratification have falsely accepted objects of sense pleasure astute of all their endeavors are doomed to fail failure. So Bhaksidanta says far too much in his purple right. When the conditioned soul comes to realize the utter futility of their endeavors to enjoy the 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 temporary manifestation of this world, they certainly become detached. That uh, so text three. When we sleeping, may see many objects of sense gratification in a dream, but such pleasurable things are merely creations of the mind, and are thus ultimately useless. Similarly, the living entity who is asleep to his spiritual identity also sees many sense objects, but. These innumerable objects of temperate gratification are creations of the Lord's illusory potency and have no permanent existence. When one meditates upon them, impelled by the senses, uselessly engages in, in intelligence. So, Paxidanta Saris Fatimaats points out again the sense ob objects observed, ob observed in one's dreams are of no value. Just as objects seen in the waking state are ultimately useless because they are they are temporary. So we sleep at night, we dream, and then we get up, we think this is nonsense, it's a temporary creation in a dream. But we think we are awake, but we are awake in the bodily consciousness, not in the soul consciousness. And that bodily consciousness, because the body has it has a beginning and an end to body. So everything in this world and our relationship to this world is temporary and therefore finally without any benefit for the spirit soul. Unless we use things in the service, uh, in the service of the Lord with detachment like in the Varnashram. Text 4. One who has fixed me within his mind as the goal of life should give up activities based on sense gratification and should instead execute work 
covered by the regulative principles for advancement. When, however, one is fully engaged in searching out the ultimate truth of the soul, one should not accept the scriptural injunctions governing fruitive activities, as a, referring to the karma, kanda. So, Paxanta Sarasvati Maharaj writes, There is no need for those who are engaged in the service of the Supreme Lord to perform fruitive activities with a desire to enhance their worldly and their worldly enjoyment. That uh, one should remain aloof from the activities of sense gratification and instead engage in unalloyed devotion and service to the Supreme Lord. Engagement in devotion and service to the Supreme Lord is real freedom from material desires. The paths of sense gratification and renunciation are always full of contradictions, whereas the service of the Lord is the doubtless path of perfection. Mm. Yeah. So, yes. The, the, the point is follow appropriate injunctions of the, of the scriptures that don't bring material enjoyment for sense gratification. The focus should be on making advancement in spiritual life. That is the essence here. Text five. That one who has accepted me as the supreme goal of life should strictly observe the scriptural injunctions forbidden, forbidding sinful activities as as far as possible should execute the it should execute sorry as far as possible should execute the injunctions prescribing minor regulative principles such as cleanliness. Ultimately, however, one should approach a bona fide spiritual master within full knowledge of me, as I am who is peaceful and who by spiritual elevation is not different from me. That, uh, yes, that's accepting a spiritual master. This text five. Can someone read the purpose, please, the word Yama. The word yama mm -hmm. refers to major regulative injunctions necessary for preserving one's purity. In Krishna consciousness movement, all bona fide members must give up eating meat, fish and eggs, and they must also avoid intoxication, mm -hmm. gambling and illicit sex. The word abhijanam means ab abhi abhijanam. Abhinam mm -hmm. indicates mm -hmm. that one cannot at any mm -hmm. time perform such forbidden activities, even in difficult circumstances. The word niyaman refers to less obligatory injunctions, such as bathing three times daily. In certain difficult situations, one may bathe three times daily, yet may still maintain one's spiritual uh, position. But if one engages in sinful, forbidden activities, even in difficult circumstances, there undoubtedly will be a spiritual fall down. Ultimately, as explained in Upadeshamrata, mere adherence to rules and regulations cannot give one spiritual perfection. One must approach a bona fide spiritual master who is mad abhijna mm -hmm. or in full knowledge of the personal form of the God. The word mad, me, negates the possibility of a bona fide spiritual master having an impersonal conception of the absolute truth. Negates the possibility of a bona fide spiritual master having an impersonal conception of the absolute truth. Furthermore, the guru must be in complete control of his senses. Therefore, he is called shanta or peaceful. Because of being completely surrendered to the mission of the Lord, such a spiritual master is 
but atmakam or non different from the personality of godhead yes in the purport many qualities of a bona fide go are mentioned but Pakshan says, Fatima, that if one is indifferent to the service of Lord Hari, one's go and the Vaishnavas, one can never achieve eternal benefit. So one who is serious in spiritual life should accept a go and learn from him. Text 6. The servant or disciple of the spiritual master should be free from false prestige, never considering himself to be the doer. It should be active and never lazy and should give up all sense of proprietorship over the object of the senses, including his wife, children, home and society. It should be endowed with feelings of loving friendship towards the spiritual master and should never become deviated or bewildered. The servant or disciple should always desire advancement in spiritual understanding should not envy anyone and should always avoid useless conversation. So now the qualities of the disciple and the path that he is following are described here. The duties of a disciple are being described. Not expect any respect from one, for oneself, not envy everyone, should be expert, free from material attachment, eager to engage in the voice and service and attain the goal of life, not find fault with others and avoid idle talks. These are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven qualities of a bona fide disciple mentioned here. So one should not forget the purpose of life and become attracted to the objects of the senses and become bewildered and go in the wrong direction. That... Um, so that brings up in our, in our heart, when we look in our heart, what do I really want? That, um, so text seven. Text seven. One should see one's real interest in life in all circumstances and should therefore remain detached from wife, children, home, land, relatives, friends, wealth and so on that uh, so when i i want to take you now to the shaman bible to come to come to six Chapter 16, King Sitraketa meets the Supreme Lord. 6, 7. Just as gold and other commodities are continually transferred from one place to another in due course of of purchase and sale, so the living entity, as a result of his fruitive activities, wanders throughout the entire universe, being injected into various bodies in different species of life uh, by one kind of father after another. A few living entities are born in the human species and others are born as animals. Although born, both are living entities, their relationships are impermanent. An animal may remain, remain in the custody of a human being for some time, and then the same animal may be transferred to the possession of other human beings. As soon as the animal goes away, the former proprietor no longer has a sense of ownership. As long as the animal is in his possession, he certainly has affinity for it. But as soon as the animal is sold, an affinity is lost. That, um, so this is the perspective of life. Um, so this we should use as a reference when we live our lives. That... Um, 
So this is, of course, then we have texts. This is very much related to text seven here. Yeah. You had text seven. Now text eight. We will hear further duties of a disciple. Uh, yeah, before before we come to that, before no, that's not further. Before I, I meant to say before we go to text eight, I want to speak about further duties of a disciple. So they are mentioned here, not think himself the enjoy of his wife, children, house, land, friends, and other possessions, knowing this to then to be intended for the Lord's service. Not try to demand respect from others to enjoy fame and reputation. Come free from envy that uh, from envy and material attachment that one should be inquisitive, the void of pride, truthful, and steady in determination. Is that all? Uh, qualities so a bona fide spirit, bona fide disciple, a qualified disciple. It's not easy to become a qualified disciple. Yeah. So now Krishna starts to explain how the spirit soul is distinct from the body. Just as fire, which burns and illuminates, is different from firewood which is to be burned to give illumination. Similarly, the seer within the body, the self-enlightened spirit soul, is different from the material body, which is to be illuminated by consciousness. Thus, the spirit soul and the body possess different characteristics and are separate entities. That, um, so we will read the commentary, the last two lines of the commentary of Pakistan says Fatimah, in the conditioned state, the spirit soul is compared to fire that is dormant within wood. That um, when the conditioned soul is enlightened on the strength of his spiritual knowledge, it can burn his ignorance to ashes, just as fire burns wood. So the simple philosophy that we are the consciousness, the soul in the body, is practically not spoken of in any other religion. The soul is eternal. The body is temporary. If we don't understand this, then there's no point of talking about where we want to go. The soul and the body have different characteristics that is explained here. Text nine. So, just as fire may appear differently as dormant, manifest, weak, brilliant, and so on, according to the condition of the few, seemingly the spirit soul enters a material body and accepts particular bodily characteristics. That. Um, so, if the purpose of Pakistan to say is Fatima, if intellectually one identifies oneself with various materialistic philosophies of life, it becomes covered by the subtle mind. When the living entity realizes that he is part and parcel of the absolute Lord Krishna, he becomes Nirupadi, free from material designations. Nirupadi. Huh? This is his constitutional position. So, so, so here is Jan that comes when one acts as a human living in the Varnashram system and accepts the spiritual master. 
who, who explains Shastra that um, so it because it may be assumed that the existence of the soul is dependent upon the gross material subtle bodies uh, then therefore we what Krishna speaks first then the subtle and gross bodies material bodies are created by the material modes of nature which expands from the potency of the supreme personality of God. Material existence occurs when the living entity falsely accepts the qualities of the gross and subtle bodies as being its own factual nature. This illusory state, however, can be destroyed by real knowledge. This, so this knowledge pulls one out of the body conception and one's perspective and understanding of meaningful activities has, has changed completely. What is the meaning for a man in, the, in bolder cons consciousness is different than for someone in spiritual consciousness. It's different. Mm -hmm. Now, text 11. See, there are commentaries by our acharyas, but I try to explain the essence, and our time is limited. Honestly, I would like to read them all. That uh, would, but it would take us a few weeks more to finish this section. <laughs> so I try to explain the essence uh, while going to it. Therefore, by the cultivation of knowledge, one should approach the Supreme Personality of God that's situated within oneself. By understanding the Lord's pure transcendental existence, one should give up the false vision of the material world as independent reality. Yeah. Uh, yes. You have to this word yata kraman. Well, this step by step. This means that after first realizing oneself to be different from the gross material body, one should then progressively detach oneself from material and mental activities. But uh, so correctly seeing what does it mean? Seeing that all things are emanations of the absolute truth. That is explained here that uh, material world is not an independent reality. When one correctly identifies oneself as an eternal spiritual form, one achieves the fruit of knowledge. When we falsely assume that temporary illusory material objects and, and, and we think that temporary illusory material objects are real, Knowledge of our eternal spiritual form is covered by ignorance. If one meditates upon the Lord's supreme presence within everything, one can return to the normal blissful state of spiritual life. Paxidante says, Fatima, hardly on the strength of one's sadhana, one should rise above the conception that the material body is the self. Twelve. The spiritual mass can be compared to the lower kindling stick, the disciple to the upper kindling stick. And the instruction given by the guru as a third stick placed in between. The transcendental knowledge communicated from guru to disciple is compared to fire arising from the contact of this, which burns the darkness of ignorance to ashes, bringing great happiness and both to the goal and the disciple. A kindling stick, making fire. That, um, so now text 13, which is, 
yeah, the last verse of this section, we can say that uh, by submissively hearing from an expert spiritual master, the expert disciple develops pure knowledge, which repels which repels the onslaught of material illusion arising from the three modes of material nature. Finally, this pure knowledge itself ceases, just as fire ceases when the stock of fuel has been con consumed. That, uh, so one must destroy the presence of illusion in one's own heart. And so this is an important purport. Who wants to read the purport first? 13. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please read. Thank you. The Sanskrit word Vaisharavi means that which is derived from the expert Visharada. Perfect transcendental knowledge comes from the expert spiritual master. And when such knowledge is heard by the expert disciple, it curbs the waves of material illusion. Since the Lord's illusory energy acts eternally within the material world, there is no possibility of destroying illusion. One may, however, destroy the presence of illusion within one's own heart. To accomplish this, the disciple must become expert in pleasing the expert spiritual master. As one advances to the perfectional stage of Krishna consciousness, experiencing the presence of the Lord everywhere, one's attention shifts to transcendental platforms. At that time, pure knowledge itself, one's constant technical awareness of illusion, diminishes just as fire diminishes and is extinguished after consuming its stock of fuel. Should I continue? Yes. Srila Madhvacharya. Srila Madhvacharya has quoted from several Vedic scriptures to show that Maya, or material illusion, is just like a witch who always haunts the conditioned souls. Maya offers the conditioned souls whatever they like within the three modes of nature. But such offerings are all just like the fire that burns the heart to ashes. Therefore, one must understand that the material world is a hellish place, offering a permanent situation to no one. Externally, we experience many things and internally, we contemplate our experience formulating plans for future action. Thus, internally and externally, we are victims of ignorance. Real knowledge comes from the Vedas, or the Supreme Personality of God, in his form of perfect wisdom. If we become fully Krishna conscious, taking complete shelter of the Lord, there will be no scarcity of pleasure, because the Lord is the reservoir of all pleasure, and his devotees freely move within that reservoir. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. That um, text. So this is the teaching of Nivrita Mark, which is opposed to the Karmakanda sections, which the Vedas teach. Nivrita Mark is the path of detachment and liberation. Yeah. Liberation comes from knowledge. Now, the explanation of Vedic philosophy, the Purva Mimamsa. The, the Purva Mimamsa says the purpose of Vanashram is piety so that you can continue enjoy. So Krishna will personally speak against this philosophy of karma coming. You know, uh, so this is 1416. My dear Udav, I've just explained to you knowledge, perfect knowledge. There are philosophers, however, who challenge my conclusion. They state that the natural position of living is to engage in fruitive activities, and they see him as the enjoyer of the happiness and the happiness that accrue from his own work. According to this materialistic philosophy, the world, time, the revealed scriptures, and the self are all variegated and eternal. 
existing as, per, as a perpetual flow of transformations knowledge, uh, moreover, cannot be one or eternal because it arises from the difference and changing forms of objects. Thus, knowledge itself is always subject to change. Even if you accept such a philosophy, my dear Udav, there will still be perpetual birth, death, old age, and disease, since all living entities must accept the material body subject to the influence of time. That, um, so I will read the purpose of Paxidanta Sarasvati, explaining the philosophy of Jaimini Rishi. That's um, on there's a purpose on this text 14. The 16, the commentary here. And, hmm. Yeah, so the, it is explained in the purple here. Here, the second paragraph and the third paragraph. Can someone first read the second paragraph, please? Can I manage? Yes, please, please. The living entity need not develop detachment from the material sense gratification, either by seeing the temporariness of individual material objects and situations, or by seeing the material world as an illusory creation, maya. According to such materialistic philosophy, material objects such as garland, sandalwood, or beautiful woman are temporary in specific manifestations, but perpetually exist through the natural flow of creation and destruction. In other words, although a particular woman form is temporary, there will eternally be beautiful woman within the material world. Thus, by carefully executing fruitive rituals according to the religious scriptures, one can maintain enjoyable contact with women and wealth life after life. In this way, one sense gratification will be eternal. Thank you. So, I'll continue, Maharaj. The, yeah, moment. This is the this Pohami Mamsa philosophy. That uh, and now the Chaimini, the philosophy of Chaimini Rishi. So one can rec read the next paragraph, only the the next one, this one. That's right. The Chaimini philosopher further say that there was ne there there never was a time when the world did not exist as it does today, which implies that there is no supreme controller who has created it. They claim that the arrangements of this world is real and appropriate and thus is not illusory. Moreover, they say that there is no eternal knowledge of an origin original perpetual form of the soul. In fact, they say Knowledge arises not from some absolute truth, but from the differences among material objects. Knowledge, therefore, is not eternal and is subject to change. The assumption hidden in this statement is that there is no spirit soul who possesses eternal, constant knowledge of a single, unchanging reality. Rather, the nature of consciousness or knowledge is that it undergoes constant transformation. They state, however, that the eternality is not refuted by the perpetually transforming nature of consciousness. Consciousness perpetually exists, they say, but not in the same form. Thank you. So then... What, what is their conclusion? That's the next paragraph. So someone can read the fourth paragraph till the end of this paragraph. Just the followers. 
two marks. Yeah. Thus, the followers of Jaimini conclude that the transformation of knowledge does not negate its eternality. Rather, they state that knowledge eternally exists within the perpetual nature of its transformation. They therefore naturally come to the path of regulated sense gratification rather than path of renunciation. For in the state of mukti or liberation, Maraj, can you move the yeah. cursor a little up, Maraj? Yeah. yeah, still, yeah. The living entity would not have any material senses and thus the transformation of material understanding would not be possible. Such philosophers consider that the achievement of an unchanging state of mukti would stunt or paralyze the natural activity of the living entity and thus would not be in its self-interest. The path of nivritti, aiming towards renunciation and transcendence of the material world, is naturally not interesting to such materialistic philosophers. Accepting, the, accepting for argument's sake the validity of such materialistic philosophy, one can easily demonstrate that the path of regulated sense gratification brings many unwanted and miserable results to the living entity. Therefore, even from the materialistic viewpoint, detachment is desirable. Material time is divided into different sections, such as days, weeks, months, and years. And by material time, the living entity is repeatedly forced to undergo the miseries of birth, death, old age and disease, that such a real miseries occur everywhere throughout the universe is well known. In this way, states Srila Vishwanatha Chakravarti Thakura, the Lord Krishna has pointed out the defect of materialistic philosophy to Uddhava. So they Thank see you. liberation as a state of pure consciousness without any activity of variety. Many such philosophers feel that liberation is an abnormal state of existence because the liberated souls would be without any activity or enjoyment. We, however, conclude that a path of regulated sense enjoyment would never provide ultimate happiness, but instead would simply award countless miseries. For this reason, even from a materialistic point of view, the attachment is in the living and being self-interest. But um, 17. In 17 here, the main point is that the living entities are depending on a higher authority. Although the performer of fruitive activities desires perpetual happiness, it is clearly observed that materialistic workers are often unhappy and only occasionally satisfied, thus proving that they are not independent or in control of their destiny. When a person is always under the superior control of another, how can he expect any valuable results from his own fruitive action? So, they are not in control. 18. It is observed within the material world that sometimes even an intelligent person is not happy. Similarly, sometimes even a grateful is happy. The concept of becoming happy through expertly performing material activities is simply a useless exhibition of, of false egotism. As far as 18, the purport of Pakistan to Saras a short one, Living entities who are averse to Krishna are always under the control of the three modes of nature. Because of this, whether they are in knowledge or in ignorance, they do not become lastingly happy. Not possible. That, um, so, also, also scientists. Kabbalah. 
कुछ भी हो श्रीनिवास गोपाल प्रभु जी प्लीज म्यूट योर सेल्फ थैंक यू थैंक यू okay then we can continue also scientists think that they will be happy by manipulating the material energy krishna gives arguments that this philosophy doesn't work in that uh, text 19 19 even if people know how to achieve happiness and avoid unhappiness they still do not know the process by which death will not be able to exert its power over them so so it means if even if one is very learned is certainly ignorant of, of how to stop death it's the point death is not at all pleasing and since everyone is exactly like a contempt man being led to the place of execution what possible happiness can people derive from material objects or the gratification they po- provide my internet connection is unstable hopefully i can remain online let's see a man who is condemned to die cannot enjoy the sometimes meal placed be- before them he cannot feel happiness the belief that wealth and sense gratification can give one happiness in this world of birth and death is herein refuted text 21 that, that material happiness of which we hear such as for most to have any plans of for celestial and enjoyment is just like that material happiness we have already experienced both are polluted by jealousy envy decay and death therefore just does not attempt to raise crops becomes fruitless if there are many problems like crop disease insect plague or drought similarly the attempt to attain material happiness either on earth or the heavenly planets is always fruitless because of innumerable obstacles that uh, so after concluding that there is no happiness in this world it is being described that there is no happiness in the hev- in the heavenly planets as well in heaven one person is envious of another's happiness there is destruction when once accumulated piety is exhausted that uh, to be read the purport of bhakti down to sarasvati maharaj of text 21 when the farmer plants his crops he has to worry about so many potential problems such as defective seeds drought plagues of insects excessive heat and so on similarly they are tend to enjoying happiness in this world whether on earth or heaven is accompanied by anxiety due to jealousy cheating and so on when the conditions souls interact there is not really competition and envy because that is the very nature of material existence due to the influence of time no position within the material world is stable and so on. when there are reverses violence and intrigue create great disturbance both here and in heaven even the attempt to attain a heavenly destination is also fraught with many difficulties therefore one should inquire about the eternal abode of the supreme personality of god that which is far beyond the disturbances of this material world that um uh, uh, that is the clear vision of bhakti siddhanta sarasvati maharaj text 22 if one performs vedic sacrifice and fruity prithals without any mistake or contamination one will achieve a heavenly situation in the next life but even this result will only uh, is which is only achieved by perfect performances of fruity prithals will, will be vanquished by time no here of this 
to the result obtained by performing fruity rituals are temporary, because whether good or bad, all material conditions are imperfect. That's the essence. 23. If on earth one performs sacrifices for the satisfaction of the demigods, he goes to the heavenly planets, where just like a demigod, he enjoys all the heavenly planets he has earned in his performances. So enjoyment on the heavenly planets is temporary, and they have to return after exhausting their pious merit. 24. Having achieved the heavenly plans, the performance of ritualistic sacrifices travels in a glowing airplane, which he obtains as a result of, of his piety on earth, being glorified by songs sung by the Gandharvas and dressed in wonderful, charming clothes, he enjoys life surrounded by heavenly goddesses. 25. Accompanied by heavenly women, the enjoy of the fruits of sacrifice goes on pleasure rites in a wonderful airplane which is decorated with circles of tinkling bells and which flies wherever he desires. Being relaxed, comfortable and happy in the material pleasure gardens, he does not consider that he is exhausting the fruits of his piety and will soon fall down to the material world. 26. Until this point, until the spice results are used up, the performance of sacrifice enjoys life in the heavenly planets. When the pious results are exhausted, however, he falls down from the pleasurely gardens of heaven, being moved against his desire by the force of eternal time. If a human, if a human being is engaged in sinful, irreligious activities, either because of bad association or because of his failure to control his senses, then such a person will slowly develop a personality full of material desires. He thus becomes miserly towards others, greedy and always anxious to exploit the bodies of women. When the mind is so polluted, one becomes violent and aggressive and without the authority of Vedic injunctions, slaughters innocent animals for sense gratification. Worshipping ghosts and spirits, the bewildered person falls fully in the grip of un un unauthorized activities and thus go to, goes to hell, where he receives a material body infected by the darkest modes of nature. In such a degraded body, he unfortunately continues to perform inauspicious activities that greatly increase his future unhappiness, and therefore he again accepts similar material bodies. What possible happiness? Can there be for one who engaged in activities inevitably terminating in death? So Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Maharaj's conclusion. So considering all this, one should never aspire for material happiness. That um, material life is so horrible. Because no matter one's duration of life might be, one will still always be afflicted by fear and death. Even Brahma is afraid of death. Considering this, what possible happiness can there be for the conditioned souls, even Brahma? That, uh, 30, the conclusion. That, um, so, in all the planetary systems from the heavenly to the hellish and for all great demigods who live for 1,000 yuga cycles, there is fear of me in my form of time. Even Brahma who possesses the supreme lifespan of 311 trillion years is also afraid of me. So Lord Krishna is the only shelter 311 trillion 40 billion years, but still, still afraid of death. So 31. The material senses create material activities, either pious or sinful, and the modes of nature set the material senses into motion. The living entity, being fully engaged by, by the material senses and the modes of nature, experience the various results of fruitive work. 
So the minute independence of the living entity consists of how it chooses to associate with the modes of nature. Unless one comes to the platform of self-realization, he continues to experience lamentation and illusion, fear. The conditioned soul can be liberated if he gives up his separate, separatist mentality and engages in the devotional service. This is the purpose of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Manj. By the perfection of devotional service, one realizes original identity of eternal knowledge and bliss. So, so that he goes to reside in Vaikuntha, the eternal abode of the Lord. Now, text 32. As long as living entity thinks that the modes of material nature have separate existences, it will be obliged to take birth in many different forms and will experience varieties of material existence. Therefore, the living entity remains completely independent on fruitive activities under the modes of nature. Completely dependent on the fruitive activities under the fruits of nature. So Krishna is energies. His energies cannot be independent from Krishna. There can be no separate existence. But we are into a separate existence. It means we do not see Krishna controlling material nature. Bhaksidanta Saraswati Maharaj comments, when the living entity is forgetful of his relationship with Krishna, he considers the material world as the ultimate reality. So the conditioned soul who remains dependent on fruitive activities under the material modes of nature will continue to fear me. The Supreme Personality of God that since I impose the result of one's fruitive activities, those who accept the material concept of life, taking the variegatedness of the material nature to be factual, devote themselves to material enjoyment and are therefore always absorbed in lamentation and Faith. So if we have false ego, then we must have lust, anger, greed, jealousy, and so on. We will read now. Yeah, yeah. Can someone read the second part of the purpose, starting with Maya as two, two potencies? Hare Krishna Maharaj, can I read? Yeah, please. Thank you. Maya has two potencies. The first covers the living entity and the second throws him down into the hellish condition of life. When one is covered by Maya, one loses all power of discrimination, and Maya then throws such a fool into the darkness of ignorance. When one wrongly considers oneself to be independent of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Krishna, one becomes a worshipper of temporary material object, hoping to enjoy material sense gratification. And as one grows older, one life becomes filled with fear and anxiety. A conditional soul considers himself to be in the control of his life. But since he does not have any actual controlling potency, his situation is contradictory and not at all pleasing. As all of one's material possessions are taken away by time, one becomes filled with lamentation. All in all, Material life is truly ab abominable, and it is only because of the dense illusion that we accept it as satisfactory. Yeah, so Maya's two potencies, it covers one's intelligence and then degrades oneself. That, um, and in my experience is that when you become a devotee, Maya sometimes covers your intelligence. That may happen, but by your sadhana, by your uh, spiritual practice, she will not be able to degrade you. That uh, so takes thirty four. When there is a citation and interaction of the material modes of nature, the living entity then, then describe me in various ways, such as all powerful time, the self, the Vedic knowledge, the universe, and one's own nature, religious ceremonies, and so on. 
that uh, so and the purport of what Sudan the Sarah's party, now that's on text 14. When the intelligence of the condition so is covered by the external energy, if it forgets the supreme personality of God, it in such a condition, some prefer to refer him as time, some refer to him as a medical literature, some refer to him as nature, some refer to him as religious principles. In this way, various fragmental understanding of the potencies of the Lord are understood. So if they are covered, then that's how they see the absolute truth as time, as nature, and so on. That's... She would have said, oh, my daughter, living entity, situated within the material body, surrounded by the modes of nature, and the happiness and distress that are born of the activities caused by these modes. How is it possible that he is not bound by this material encirclement? It may also be said that a living entity is ultimately transcendental and has nothing to do with the material world. Then how, how is he ever bound by material nature? That, uh... So yes, this is text 35. So by following Varnashram, one gets knowledge that do not try to enjoy piously, do not follow Karmakanda, what Krishna has said. And now Udav is asking two questions, which are going to be answered in the next chapter, which deals with the symptoms of conditioned and liberated souls. That text 36, 37. Oh, my Lord, as Suta, the same living entity is sometimes described as eternally conditioned and other times as eternally liberated. I'm not able to understand if, therefore, the actual situation of the living entity. You, my Lord, are the best of those who are expert in answering philosophical questions. Please explain to me the symptom by which one can tell the difference between a living entity which is eternally liberated and one which is eternally conditioned. In what various ways... Would they remain situated, enjoy life, eat, evacuate, lie down, sit, or move about? That uh, so on this last verse, that uh, we have the purport of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj. In Chaitanya Charitamrita, it is stated, Shivaras, Vibhavai, Krishna, Nityadas, Krishna, Tatastha, Sakti, Veda, Veda, Prakash. It is the living ent entity's constitutional position to be an et eternal servant of Krishna because he is the marginal energy of Krishna and the manifestations simultaneously, one and different from the Lord. Krishna, Bodhisattva, Jiva, Anadi, Bayar, Mukha, Ataiva, Maya, Taradeya, Samsara, by forgetting Krishna, the living entity has become materialistic since time immemorial. Therefore, the illusory energy of Krishna is giving him different types of miseries in the material existence. So condition, conditional and liberated. Both these stages, these states are adjectives. Those two natures we see when seen from different angles are known to be by two different names, according to the difference in the propensity of service of the conditioned and liberated states are ascertained. When one is manifested, the other disappears. So when one serves Krishna, one goes to liberation. When one does not serve Krishna, but serves something else, then yes, one becomes conditioned. So since the living entity is sometimes called eternally conditions, how could he ever be considered eternally liberated or vice versa? This is an apparent contradiction which, which will be cleared up by the Supreme Personality of God. He's asking between the, the complex relationship between the soul and the entanglement in the illusory energy. So now we are going in the sixth chapter to in the next chapter to Jan, go from karma to Jan. And from in this next chapter, 
the Hyan will move us towards Bhakti. That's the next chapter. So, any comments or questions, please? Yes, Chanko Vinnapa. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, this uh, Jaimini is a disciple of Srila Vasudev. Why he is presenting a philosophy which is contrary uh, to what uh, Vasudev Ji has presented? That, uh, yeah, that is because he is a propounder of the Purva Mimamsa philosophy that karma is supreme. And uh, Krishna uses that philosophy also in uh, to convince his father not to perform the Indra Jahyam. That uh, yeah, Chaimini is a Muni. A Muni is a mental speculator. That, uh, uh, yes, is his speculation is Purva Mimamsa. But you have the six darshans, which you all know. They have all their propounders or their and they are in in essence they are speculations and therefore atheistic because they are not directly connected with the Supreme Lord. But still Krishna sees them as, accepts them as sages, and these philosophies must be there, because people want to be brought into illusion, that, uh, and yes, they, uh, they need philosophies to active, to, uh, to uh, make their speculations or their understandings valid and there are so, so many kinds of philosophies but finally the six actions because Purva Mimamsa that uh, the Uttara Mimamsa is the Bhakti Vedanta or the, the Vedanta that the uh, higher knowledge and that is bhakti. That um, those who perform this karma kamna, the idea is after a long time, they will realize I'm going to heaven, I'm coming back, going up and down. But what's the use of that? Is there another solution? And then they by, by the mercy of a devotee, they start to question, who am I? And then they come to Hyan. The idea is they, they come to Hyan. But, uh, but people want to be bewildered, and Krishna gives the in instruments also for bewilderment. That, uh, that's uh, Buddha, Buddha appeared, to bewilder the people, to reject the Vedas. And there was a reason for that. But, so these are the inconceivable ways of the Lord that uh, he provides also all atheistic philosophies so that people can become bewildered. And therefore, Chaimini had to take that service. <laughs> That's uh, an unfortunate service. Like, uh, yeah, many, like Jai and Vijay became Iranyaksa, Iranyakasapu. They had to serve the Lord also in that way. Yes. That's my understanding about hearing from Burjan Prabhu and Srila Prabhupada. That's why these philosophies are there. That, Good. Thank you, Marit. Thank you. Then we will continue tomorrow with the symptoms of conditioned and liberated souls. We are on track with our time, so that's good.
that if you have any questions or whatever, please note them down, ask them next time, because this, uh, yeah, we, we went to the text, but quite quickly, because our time is restricted. That is restricted, but read please all the commentaries that are in the BBT uh, presentation. That uh, that it's good to go in self study a little deeper. Also, yes, Rama Krishna for me. Hare Krishna, Vinod Maharaj. Maharaj, where do we get the commentaries of Shri Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati? Is it available as a soft copy? Yeah. They, they are in, in this book. This book. Okay. That is, Could you put yeah. the title, Mother? Yeah. With commentary of Vishwanachika Bhakti Thakur, chapter summaries and purports by Shila Bhakti Dante Sarasvati Thakur. And this is from Touchstone Media. You can, I'd probably in Vrindavan in the bookstore or many old books. It's come bookstores, you can find this book. Is this only for 11th Canto? That is the Udav, that's the Udav Gita, which is a part of the of the 11th Canto. Canto, starting at chapter 7, where we started together, till chapter 28 of 29, I think. 29. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that is the Udav Gita, and you can get that. And it's nice, In you have the purpose, First, first you have the, the BBT commentary, more or less the same at Vishwanathak Bhakti Thakur mostly. And then you have a, a separate purport of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj. But, um, so that's, I strongly recommend that for your self study to, to read this uh, Udab Gita. Other, uh, Thank you so much. Is it possible you share your PowerPoint from Uddhava Gita, please? Yeah, if someone can give me, share with me their WhatsApp number. Then no, I Mara, do you have a uh, I have yours, Mara, yes. I will send it to you. You, that, Then they can get it from you. No problem. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. See you tomorrow. Jai Prabhupada. Bhakti Prabhu Swami Maharaj Ki Jai Prabhupada Ki Jai